How many saw Inconvenient Truth or read the book? Remember that the mentor for Al Gore was Roger Revell. He was 10 years older than me, a great friend. And in 1957, he said, damn it. The transfer coefficients from the atmosphere into the ocean are not as great as we thought they would be, and we're not going to have the ocean simply take the carbon out of the air carbon dioxide, that problem will not be solved. By the end of the 70s, the Cray computers, which only the US military and the National Center for Atmospheric Research had, said, we're going to have something called global warming. The Earth's going to heat up something like 6 or 8 degrees Fahrenheit, and it'll be three times that bad at the poles, and it'll be almost nothing at the equator. It was just as if we'd made a calculation that said, if you fly an airplane and the wings go up this many million times, one of those puppies is going to fall off. So you don't fly that long with that wing. There has never been a doubt in my mind since I sat at the base of a Cray computer, 1979, and watched it run, that we were headed for global warming. It is absolutely real. It has nothing to do with many of the measurements that are being made now. If you roll the window up in a car in the summer in Arizona, it gets up to about 150 degrees. That's because solar radiation, which is 0.47 microns, goes through the glass, heats up the surface inside. The re-radiation is absorbed by the glass, and half of it comes back inside. Those equations were valid then. They're valid now. And this nonsense about global warming not being real, not being caused by carbon dioxide in the air is nonsense. We had better have a solution to global warming that does more than make windmills, that has nuclear power plants. We better, and we will, regreen the earth. If I don't have the solution to global warming. Don't misunderstand that. I have a technology that I'd like to tell you about that is a component of a solution that involves the only two anti-entropic processes on the Earth. Physicists use the term entropy to mean increasing disorder. Here, Jeremy Rifkin, an environmentalist, wrote a book called Entropy, Welcome to the Greenhouse World. He gives an example of the Japanese go to Australia, they mine iron from a concentrated deposit, they take it to Japan, they make Toyotas, they send them to the US, we drive them, then we throw them in a junkyard, the, the, the iron that was in them rusts away and ends up in the sea as molecules and it's no longer available. The major anti, the one of the two major anti-entropic processes is a green plant. When you go outside, I love these trees. Look at them, touch one of them, they're the other half of your lung. They take carbon dioxide out of the air, remember us putting it in as a problem, and they give us back oxygen, food, and beauty. The other anti-entropic process is what this conference is all about if you speak physics. It's human intelligence. Those two processes together will solve global warming they will make possible a better and better future instead of an entropic future, which is declining. We have evolved now to space satellites. We've gone to the moon and come back. And we have two other satellites now that are US satellites called the GRACE satellites, the gravitational satellites. There are two of them. They go around the Earth continuously. They're linked by a laser, and they measure the gravitational pull below them. The ice melt off the Antarctic was exactly 154 cubic kilometers per year two years ago. Off of Greenland, it was 208. Those satellites tell us that if we built a seawater river in Sonora, Mexico, as we have, and we pump it at 1,000 cubic meters per second, which we do for shrimp farms, and we keep about 70% of that water from going back into the sea, we put it into the atmosphere, we put it into the soil, 
in this one project, we can solve 20% of the ice melt of the Antarctic, not as a cost, but as an investment. This is a seawater river coming inland. It's reversing the flow of 10,000 years. The nutrients that we've eroded into the soil, since into the sea, since the invention of, of uh, agriculture, we're going to take back. We're going to grow aquatic products. We're going to use those aquatic products to produce a bio, uh, the uh, seawater to produce a biofuel to power transportation, power production, etc. This is Seawater Farms Eritrea. I heard a number of presentations on Africa today that touched the very base of my heart. I was giving a speech in Asmara, Eritrea when the planes hit the tower. I had lived in Eritrea, Africa for four and a half years. On the right up there at the top is a small seawater river coming in. Those are shrimp ponds, those are canals, those are lakes full of fish. They produce shrimp, seaweed, bivalves, tilapia, a crop called salicornia that's an oilseed crop that gives us biofuels, mangroves, etc., etc. These are Eritreans harvesting a very high value crop, shrimp. The excrement from the shrimp goes into ponds where we grow fish. This crop is salicornia. It is a crop you'll hear a lot about. NASA has picked this as the source of the sustainable biofuel of the future. It takes carbon out of the air at a huge rate. It puts it in the soils. It solves these problems, contributes to solving the problems of global warming as it creates wealth. This is intercropping of that crop and mangroves, which will be the forest of the future. This is the root of a mangrove tree. This is a phenomenal plant. Those are pneumatophores. They stick up in the air and take carbon out of the air. We don't know what to do with it. You put it in the soil, and instead of destroying soil, this project creates soil. This is a forest of mangrove trees. When we went to Eritrea, there were 12 bird species in this area. Now there are over 200. There is evidence that in India, children that drink camel's milk do not get asthma, even though they have terrible air pollution problems, whereas those without camel's milk do get asthma. It's because of the diversity of the plants. Those camels are coming from as far as 25 kilometers away, and they're drinking fresh water, which is floating on the seawater. We create a device where we can collect fresh water in a freshwater lens floating on seawater. The water on the other side of the road is twice as salty as seawater. This is the seed of that salicornia crop. The favorite food of camels and goats in that area are mangrove leaves. This is Sea Forest Biodiesel 10. That's Christer Selin from Sweden. He is head of the Selin Foundation and a great supporter of this work. When it says 10, it means that integrated system, those mangroves with their roots, those meadows of salicornia, takes 10 times the carbon out of the air that goes in when you use that oil. This means if you converted your uh, transportation fleet to diesel and 10% of that used this, the transportation system would be out of the equation. That was Eritrea, Africa. This is Mexico. About 70,000 acres of shrimp farms along the coast between Bahia Quino, Sonora and Waimas, Sonora. That brown stuff you see is effluent from shrimp farms going north in the summer into the next shrimp farm. That's not a good idea. But that's a resource, it's not a problem. You take it inland, you never let it go into the sea, and you create what you just saw. These pumps, just in that area, pump out of the sea 20% of the ice melt of the Antarctic. 50 rivers of that size in 34 countries down the east coast of Africa, uh, in Iran, in Pakistan, in India, will stop sea level rise. There's a brilliant paper coming out by NASA pretty soon talk about the, the uh, triangle of conflict. Power, water, food. You know what a mess it is. You know how much we're paying for fuel. You know that there's food riots in, uh, in uh, Egypt, etc., etc. This is not a triangle of conflicts with the right intelligence, with the kind of creative thinking that's going to come out of this conference. It's a triangle of opportunity. This is my punchline. 
if you park this 1946 Woody at the edge of the sea anywhere, whether it's New Orleans or on the West Coast where the Beach Boys did their thing, and we continue the way we're going, by the year 2060, which is just a minute, guys, I was just a few minutes ago, I got here in Chicago in 1958, the sea level will be across the front window. That's where the seas are headed. The cost of that for the 10 cities most hit, with five of them in the U.S., is $3 trillion. The worldwide cost is $35 trillion. For only $50 billion, you can build those seawater farms. You can give people in Mexico jobs, in Eritrea jobs. By the way, in Eritrea, if you have a job, you make 30 cents a day, three zero cents a day. And if you build them at the same rate, it won't get above the hubcaps. The Everglades won't be destroyed. They'll be destroyed from seawater coming up from the bottom if we don't do this. And we'll make a new kind of business, the kind that, that uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. was talking about, an environmentally enhancing, highly profitable, free market business and will create millions of jobs.